It's time for Windows Weekly with Paul Therod. And we're going to begin on a sad note, a farewell to uh, the man who wrote our Windows Weekly theme, a tribute to Derek K. Miller coming up, plus all the Microsoft news next on Windows Weekly. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Windows Weekly is provided by CashFly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Windows Weekly with Paul Therott, episode 207, recorded May 5th, 2011. You've been Walshed. Windows Weekly is brought to you by GoToAssist Express. Offering tech support in person is expensive and time consuming. Save time and money and look like a hero to clients or colleagues with GoToAssist Express. For a free 30-day trial, visit gotoassist.com slash windows. And by Netflix. Watch thousands of TV episodes and movies streamed to your PC or Mac instantly. Plus, get DVDs by mail in about one business day. For your free 30-day trial, go to netflix.com slash twit. And by audible.com. To download the free audiobook of your choice, go to audible.com slash windows. It's time for Windows Weekly, episode 207, and the continuing saga of what's Microsoft up to now. And there is no better person in the world to tell us than the man behind the super site for Windows, winsupersite.com, Mr. Paul Therott, analyst with Penton Media, author of many fine tomes, including Windows Phone 7 Secrets. I don't know why I laugh every time you introduce me. <laughs> it, se it seems so ludicrous. <laughs> and star of stage and screen, it's Paul Therott, ladies and gentlemen. Yep, hey, Paul. How it's are me. you? <laughs> How are you? I'm pretty good. Yeah. How are you? Well, it's a little somber, actually, because uh, yeah. for the since the day we started this show, 200-plus episodes ago, uh, our theme has always been a theme that I had found on the Internet. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm kind of a cheapskate when it comes to themes, so I try to find um, unsigned artists who are willing to offer pod-safe themes. And I, I found... I, went, Gaga, but you went with. I, would like, I would have liked to have used Poker Face, but it wasn't around yet. So instead, we used a uh, a great song, which I, I think will uh, on this particular episode play in its entirety mm -hmm. uh, at the end of the song uh, by a very talented musician named Derek K. Miller. He lives in or lived in Vancouver, and I think because of the song, we got to know him. Derek was a regular on the TV show I did in Vancouver, The Lab with Leo. He would talk about music and recording. He had his own podcast about uh, recording, uh, and just was a genial great guy even then uh he knew he had cancer uh and was not i think he was not sure how it would progress um and some days it, it seemed better than others uh but i'm uh very sad to report that eric uh derek did pass away uh this week on uh, on may 4th yesterday actually and did something i thought just uh, yeah moving. I, I can't call it surprising because if you've been reading along because he's been very open about it uh this is sort of in keeping with the way he does things you know he uh, posted his his blog which has been up and down because of the great interest uh his post generated uh it's a penmachine.com he posted what he calls the last post and um it begins here it is i'm dead and this is my last post to my blog in advance, I asked that once my body finally shut down from the punishments of my cancer, then my family and friends published this prepared message I wrote, the first part of the process of turning this from an arc active website to an archive. Uh, it is a beautiful, moving post about his life, but mostly about uh, his family, his daughters, Lauren, who's just 11, Marina, who's 13, his wife, Airdrie, um, how they met, um, how he feels about leaving them behind. Um, it's, I, I almost feel like it's something I could have written. And I think that's one of the things that's so touching about this is, uh, he is every man in, in this sense. And, and I think he passed with incredible grace, um, and such a beautiful post. It is truly remarkable. 
Um, he says, the world, indeed, at the end, the world, indeed, the whole universe is a beautiful, astonishing, wondrous place. There's always more to find out. I don't look back and regret anything, and I hope my family can find a way to do the same. What is true is that I loved them, Lauren and Marina, as you mature and become yourselves over the years. Know that I loved you and did my best to be a good father. Erdry, you were my best friend and my closest connection. I don't know what we'd have been like without each other. But I think the world would be a poorer place. I loved you deeply. I loved you. I loved you. I loved you. It is so beautiful. And uh, I, I just hope everybody goes to Pen Machine. And uh, and there's already thousands of yeah. likes and tweets and already 143 comments. There would be more, but uh, there was so much traffic on the site that they couldn't take comments. They may still not be able to take comments uh, for a long time. So um, I just thought we should we should mark that because uh, Derek was our friend and uh, yeah. and did create the theme for uh, Windows Weekly which we'll hear in its entirety uh, it was it's not called Windows Weekly theme either <laughs> it should I, be <laughs> well when you hear it you, but it's really you know he's such a talented musician yeah uh, I think it was it was red better red I can't remember exactly the the name I just know it as the theme but uh, we'll play it again and, uh, and and play it for you in its entirety at the end of the show Huh. Sorry to begin on a somber note, but I think in some ways, you know, this is exactly how I'd like to end it. It was really, it was really touching. Right. He was 41 years old. Uh, meanwhile, what's happening in the world? I almost, I almost, I can't do this. <laughs> well, that's it for our show. Thank you very much, uh, yeah. The stuff uh, I have to talk about is slightly <laughs> less important. Um, By slightly, I mean as... as <laughs> Much Utterly. less important as it can be. But, you know, Derek loved technology. He loved computers. He was yeah. really thrilled to be part of the uh, of the show and have written the theme song. You know, he had, he, that really, that was ex so exciting to him when I sent him an email saying, may we use this? Uh, and he, d he just was, you know, just a great guy. Yep. Great guy. So um, we have much to talk about. I'll tell you what. Mm-hmm. Uh, we do have the Microsoft earnings uh, to talk about because they came in right at the end of the show uh, last week, and you've had a chance now to, to parse them. So we yes. will talk about that. Uh, we got to talk more about Sony. And now another breach that affects a lot of us mm -hmm. uh, deeply, which is the last pass breach. Holy cow. Yep. And then, as usually, many tips, picks, solutions, and not one, not two, but three Audible book picks. <laughs> you, you just couldn't settle, huh? <laughs> it's actually a perfect one for uh, yeah. this week. Perfect picks. So we'll get to those in just a second. Before we do, uh, let me mention our friends at Citrix. This would be a good time to take a break. What, dab a tear from the eye? Uh, Citrix, of course, does a great product for people who are in the uh, support business. You know who you are, the people who spend a lot of time on the phone saying, click start. Okay, now click run. <laughs> Okay, you're going to see a little box. I want you to type S C A N. No, S S C. You know what I mean. It's the worst telephone support. And if you've done it, you know it's painful. In fact, I would guess, I'd, I'd venture that the, the, the thing that crosses your mind each and every time is if I could just reach my hands out into that person's machine, I could fix it so fast and move on. That's where GoToAssist Express is so awesome. Now, there are other tools. I'm, I'm not unaware of those other tools. There are many other tools. But there is none better than GoToAssist Express because of its heritage. It's a Citrix product. means it, it's the best remote access, the fastest, the easiest to use, the most secure. But it's also uh, easy for your clients, and I like that. They don't have to have it installed ahead of time. And I'll tell you, I gave it the mom test. Uh, <laughs> this was uh, probably more than a year ago. Um, mom said, I, I, you know, needed, she needed some help. I sent her the link. She pressed the button. She had one other button to press, which is allow, because it's a little Java stub. It goes in there, and boom, I'm in her machine. I'm fixing it. She loves seeing that mouse move around, seeing the things get all fixed automatically. You could chat with your clients. You can have eight sessions at once, so you don't have to wait for a scan or install to finish before you move on. That makes you more efficient. Uh, and you can even do it unattended if your clients allow you. Which means you don't have to wait till they show up. Your productivity goes up a lot. In fact, on average, go to Assist Express users say they're getting a forty percent increase, forty four zero, in productivity. That's what is that like two extra days a week without working harder? 
reduce travel, increase revenue, service more clients, make more out of your workday, and you could do it free for the next 30 days when you visit go to assist dot com slash windows g o t o assist dot com slash windows it's a really great solution try it free and i think you'll like it paul Thrott, let us uh, let us start with the microsoft earnings they came in we talked a little bit about them last week because they came in just as we were finishing up yeah pretty amazing i mean i think that the headline that everybody covered was for the first time ever apple's more profitable than microsoft but that's not the yeah, story. well, and that was sort of a foregone, uh, foregone conclusion in the sense that it was going to happen eventually. Right. They just missed it last quarter. So, right. um, you know, it's going to happen. I mean, that's just the way it was. But I, Microsoft's in a tough spot because they make a lot of money. But as we've discussed so many times, they're no longer the trendsetter, you know, in the tech industry. And uh, from the perspective of people like you and I or the people who listen to this podcast, where what we're concerned about is, to, you know, uh, technology enthusiasm, essentially. You know, Microsoft risks becoming that next IBM. You know, um, a very large and very successful company, yeah. yes, but one that is no longer driving the engine, you know. And you, think that I, would have, I, you think that would have happened? Uh, or anybody would have expected that to have happened, say, yeah. 10 years ago? I mean, that Microsoft would not be on top in 2011. Well, you know, how could you see the future, right? So uh, 10 years ago, Microsoft was embroiled in their U.S. antitrust case, and they had, uh, I, I believe it was 10 years ago this year, that they settled with the U.S. government, if I'm right. not mistaken. Yep. Google was a non-entity. Apple had just emerged from near bankruptcy and was doing fine for a company of their size, <laughs> you know, a smaller company. Um, no, I mean, who could have seen what would have happened over the past decade? But I think the reality is that it's not so, well, I'm sorry, I shouldn't say that. I was going to say it's not so much because of Apple and Google. I would say that it is a combination of both competitors who are more aggressive than Microsoft and also seized on the opportunity provided to them by the antitrust actions against Microsoft in the U.S., in Korea, in Europe, that really shackled the company, changed its behavior, and prevented it from acting in the overly aggressive ways that it used to act in the past. I mean, some of those things are natural, right? The company gets older. I mean, companies get, get older. That's what happens. But, you know, they get more mature and they slow down and all that stuff. Uh, Microsoft is trying to make a case for the fact that it is a successful consumer electronics type company, but I really don't see a lot of evidence of that. Um, obviously, the most successful product they have in that category is the Xbox. But, you know, the Xbox, uh, I want to say it's something like 15% of their revenues. Um, that's it. You know, 85% is still Windows, Office, Windows Server. And those are legacy products. They're traditional, uh, and by the way, traditionally delivered to this day still, legacy computing products. I mean, they're successful, yes. I mean, and we're going to have needs for PCs and for servers for many years going forward. And Office is still running uh, fast. Go can ahead, I just say I'd be very happy to earn more than a billion dollars a month in profit? <laughs> yeah, any company. But but here's the thing, and I, I don't know anything about companies outside of our business. So I guess what I would say to you is there are probably lots of companies out there, or some companies out there that make profits like that or revenues like that that I don't know anything about or care anything about. And as we've discussed in the past, my fear for Microsoft is that they become a company like that. Right. You know, Nestle probably makes a lot of money, but who cares? Right. Or you know, there are various car uh, companies or oil companies or whatever, ConAgra or, you know, whatever these companies are. I don't know. I don't care. But that's because in the tech industry, we have this kind of um, phony kind of expectation yeah. that these companies be exciting and new because it's all yeah. new and exciting. But it is yep. inevitable at some point. It just becomes another industry like steel, like soybeans, yeah. like automotive. I mean, it's just a business. It's an industry. Uh, Does it have yeah. to be like... All the sizzle? <laughs> yes, Leo, it does. Oh, okay. Because <laughs> Cause we get bored. Because, We're easily bored. You, this show becomes CNBC, but for, <laughs> but for Windows, right? I mean, who cares? By the way, CNBC, I, I, extraordinarily profitable. Okay, well, great. Just Good for that. that I, you know, I just don't have an interest in that, personally. And I suspect most of the people listening to this don't either. I know what you either. mean. Yeah. So, for example, when something like Windows becomes as hyper-popular as it is, it becomes... 
a commodity in a way. It becomes something right. that needs to be nurtured along on a very predictable path. Otherwise, the very businesses that made it successful will revolt. Success so, breeds boredom. Yes, you can't come out with a radically new version of Windows every year or every five right. years. You need to kind of chug this thing along on a predictable path. That's how you, you know, you spread out your profits, you spread out your spending. You, it, it turns into this mature thing. Now, that's great, I guess, you know, from Microsoft's perspective. But from, you know, again, from my perspective, from the perspective of technology enthusiasts, which I assume we all are, um, it, you know, it becomes a little less interesting. It's the reason we're, we're, that so many of us... We're in it for the lulls. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, even on, but even on my own... It, when I, when I think about my own coverage of Microsoft, Microsoft products, there are exciting periods of time when Microsoft is prepping uh, a tier one product revision, you know, something like the next version of Windows or the next version of Office. Like these are big deals. So for that short period of time, as someone covering the technology, you know, from my perspective, there's, a, there's this short period of time that's very exciting. But then these things go into maintenance mode, essentially. And then what? You know, you can see how I handle it. I'll publish tips about a product or you know, it, it go into the various features and you kind of extend the period of time that you can cover a product because you're not just talking about it in the buildup to the release. You want to talk about it after it's out. But I mean, inevitably, uh, this gets boring, you know, and, and we, here we are. We're literally at the halfway point between versions of Windows. It seems like an eon since they released Windows 7, even though it's only been about a year and a half. Um, and it seems like it's an eon until the next version of Windows ships. So whenever they have their first beta, the, the September or whenever that happens, or, you know, the release candidate or the public, you know, pre-release version that comes out. These are going to be very exciting because, you know, we're basically biding our time until that happens. And I, I think that's where we're at. When, when I've talked so much in the past about uh, how exciting new platforms are. And the reason it's so exciting to start over from scratch is because a it's dangerous. It, it's not always successful. So there's yeah. an element of danger it's to exciting. it. Exciting, but there's also more going on. When you release something that is by definition 1.0, not finished, not ready for the real world. Whether you're talking about the you know the first version of the iPhone, which was wonderful but had all these little flaws, the first version of Windows Phone, which also wonderful but lots of little flaws. Um, anytime you start over from scratch with anything, it's exciting because it's new. And it's a chance to get, you know, stuff maybe that you did wrong in the past, get it right this time and all that kind of stuff. You know, Windows, uh, you know, they can, there's only so much overhauling you can do to Windows. It has to run Windows apps. So it's not going to be that much different, you know. As good as Windows 7 is, Windows 7 is really just an evolution of Windows Vista, a product that most people are trying to disavow now, but... Really, Windows 7 is just Vista 1.1. So, well, and again, as you say, that's the nature of the business. That's what they have to do. That's what they want to do. Yeah. It's just not as exciting for people who always yeah. want something uh, new. There are going to be people out there in the financial community. I've had a couple of people write me along these lines as well where they say, you know, um, Microsoft has uh, a profitable future ahead of it and uh, a good long-term uh, view and all that kind of stuff. And yeah, uh, neat, neat. But... Uh, you know, Apple's going to come up with the iPhone 5 this year. Oh, sorry. That's a lot more exciting for more people than this long-term view thing you're talking about. So um, it's just a matter of, you know, where the enthusiasm lie. You know, and <laughs> we talked about this before the show. <laughs> were, were you saying something? Because I have to make it. A... <laughs> Never mind. Here's what made that particularly galling in my opinion. What's that? It was like 25 people laughing in the background. Yeah, I don't know. You know, they sit there in the other room and they just wait for me to do something stupid. So anyway, I, I you know. <laughs> no, you're it's right. You're right. I mean, but I wonder if analysts are not doing themselves a disservice because truthfully, yeah. wouldn't you want a company that's just slow and steady and makes money and is profitable and doesn't take risks? Well, who risks? are you when you say as an analyst? I guess so. I mean, I you know, I don't know. I, I like... I, I like, for example, this didn't happen with Windows Phone, and I feel that this was a missed opportunity. I would have really liked, I like that Microsoft came up with this thing early before it was ready. They're not going to ever admit that, but let's face it, that's the, what they did. They needed to get into the market very quickly. I was all over that. What I would have liked to have seen in this case in particular is the people who buy this thing in that first year are early adopters. They're technology enthusiasts, you know. Reward them 
by letting them live on the edge for that first year and just repetitively, repeatedly update this thing again and again and again. <laughs> Scare the so hell really, out of them. <laughs> put, put us through the ringer because we would love it. We would love it. Yeah. Interact with us in a way and say, Wait a minute. here are three features we could implement. Which one do you want first? That's a good idea. You know, that kind of thing. I but love they that. They, they, don't. They, they don't because these guys who make Windows Phone are the product of the old school Microsoft Windows Vista team. And they move slow and they move plotting and they, they refuse to communicate anything. And what we're left with is like this. We're in this weird void where it's just. I don't like that stuff. But 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 I think, so there's the one side, which is what I was saying. Well, it's yeah. good business. You know, you, you grind out the profits. What's wrong with a billion a month? That's good. The other yeah. side, it, it, I think people might misinterpret you because yep. one could say, well, just keep it exciting, even if it's bad business. But really what you're saying is that in the future, and I think this is true, mm -hmm. businesses will engage their customers. It's no longer, and I think this is the this is how everything is changing thanks to the internet. It's no longer a business just saying, here's our product, take it or leave it. If you like it, buy it. Here's our product. Bridgestone tires, Bridgestone well, tires. Except for one thing, that's what Apple does, right? I mean, well, it is the, what Apple does, but somehow the, the they engage, they, this. they still engage their users let me, somehow. So this is something I've been trying to formulate into a, a concrete thought. Maybe we can make it happen here live in real time. But on the one hand, we have Microsoft. This company has to have, it's it allows its employees to blog publicly. Obviously, they can't violate certain. Uh, no, but they they're pretty open. Much they're more so open. than they're, they're than pretty Apple. open. They're extremely yeah. open. They have yeah. hundreds and hundreds of blogs, public blogs. I mean, they had Scoble for a crying out loud. Okay, but right now, I mean, right now, you could look around and there are all these blogs. Yeah. Blogs and blogs and blogs. Very open. And Love over that. on the other side, we have Apple. They don't have a single blog. There's no one from Apple blogging anything. Yeah, they how dare they? Them. Phil Schiller has a Twitter account, but does he tweet? No. Yeah, once every 17 months, the guy has a little utterance of some kind. Yeah. Okay. Which of those companies seems like it's more poised for success? Especially along the lines of what you just described, engaging with your customers, you know, it's it's not Apple, but Apple is the one that is more successful in many ways. Well, so I would take the we with out. They don't engage with their customers, but they do engage yeah. their customers, and they engage them in some kind of tricky ways. By one way to engage our interest is by not telling us a thing. <laughs> well, that strategy is not working for Windows Phone, I can tell you that. <laughs> they're, so, they're obsess people obsess about Apple, but I think in general, I mean, what certainly what yeah, Twit tries to do this so far is incorporate our audience into yeah. um, what we do. So I, before the show, for instance, we're building the studio. I show what's going on in the studio, the, the ups and the downs of studio construction. We are yep. giving people a chance, and we'll launch this next week, to buy uh, a, an engraved brick with their name on it on the wall. Right. These are things that I think modern companies are going to do. Not that. Yep. Microsoft's not going to say, hey, would you like a brick in the Microsoft garden? But they might do <laughs> other things. I think what you said is great. Here's yes. three features we could implement in the next edition yep. of Windows Phone. What, th what one would you like right. is huge. Oh, my God. People would be all over that. It's but huge. I don't think like that. Apple does. Somebody's in the chat room saying, and I think he's right, uh, El Scorcho mm -hmm. <laughs> in the chat room says, Apple engages its customers in, with the retail stores. And that is true. There is this, there is, those stores draw you in, you mm -hmm. touch the stuff, you play with the stuff, and the employees are very much taught to engage, not to stand oh, I, back. Uh, so I, I, the Apple retail thing to me is the Neiman Marcus experience. You know, a lot of people have said to me, you know, it Apple's exactly. the best support in the world. They've got this, that, you know, they do. But the thing you need to understand is that you're paying for that up front. Right. Um, with other PC makers, you have the opportunity to pay extra for extra support. But with Apple, that cost is built into the machine. You pay for it up front. So there is this wonderful experience at the Apple Store. And by the way, not just at the Apple Store, but also when you deal with them electronically. That Apple has this wonderful back and forth um, that goes on. You know, I talked about the virtues of the Microsoft Store online um, some months ago and the signature experience, which I feel is excellent. But on the other hand, uh, you know, you go to that store to see what's going on with the PCs. And as someone who follows, uh, say, a company like Lenovo very closely, which I do, and I look at all the ThinkPads that are coming, and I know the dates that they're available and which models are coming and so forth. You know, unfortunately, um, the Microsoft Store online only has three Lenovo models, two ThinkPads. When I, uh, well, actually, they have more than that. But they, there are two ThinkPads and one IdeaPad that I'm thinking of in particular. They're all last year's models. They're not, the, in the case of the ThinkPads, are not the versions that just started shipping. So they're still selling machines that came out a year ago. Um, this is the type of thing you would never see at the Apple Store, of course, because they sell only their own machines. But 
It's also an interesting, I'm sure they have the reasons, but it, it's an interesting comparison because it's why Microsoft can never truly achieve the same experience that Apple has. They can only try to get as close as possible, given the limitations of their partnerships, which also have other benefits, but in this case, it happens to be a limitation. Yeah, uh, but, I, well, and, and I would underscore the fact that it's not necessarily bad business. It's just, it's different. And I do think... Yeah, it, it's different. It's exactly right. It's different. So... It's more traditional. Yeah, increasingly more traditional, absolutely, uh, in Microsoft's case. Anyway, I, I look, I've said this before, and I, people seem to think I just say these things, but, you know, I really do prefer... <laughs> he thinks about Windows. them, folks. <laughs> no, I actually think about them, and I actually believe them, I, I and... Um, I prefer Windows to the Mac. It's not like I'm going to suddenly switch to Mac OS X or something. Um, there are advantages to Apple products in certain cases. I was talking with Raphael earlier today about my gym has switched over their elliptical trainers. And now we've got this big electronics thing going on. And you plug your iPod into it. Instead of just listening to your iPod, you can listen to the iPod through the machine. But now the machine saves your workout to the iPod. And then it gets uploaded to the Nike Plus website for free and you can track your workouts over time well this is a feature you only get if you have an ipod you know it's not the reason to buy an ipod instead of something else but it is one of i don't know 117 reasons <laughs> you know places where it is better so you know it's it's a tough thing i mean uh how do you compete with that <coughs> excuse me yeah it, I, I just think that um Times are changing, so the expectations yeah. have changed. You look at what Ford has done. I think it's very interesting. You know, um, I'd love to take credit for uh, Ford having the, you know, genius to advertise on Twit. But in fact, it's a, <laughs> it's a global strategy yeah. that Ford wants yep. to engage its audience, and so they're very interested in social media, new media, because they see it as a way to, you know, they've got a big active Facebook page, engage the audience. And I think that it's interesting to see this old lumbering industrial it, giant, hundred year old industrial giant say, hmm, business is changing. If, if, uh, I don't know if you watch Mad Men. I uh, love Mad Men. We're finally catching up. So we're, so we watched, just started watching it late. We were able to watch the first three and a half now. We're in the fourth season, um, you know, back to back, which has been very excellent. <laughs> but it's a great show, period. But it's interesting to watch because this occurs at a certain period in time. They, intersperse the episodes with historical events very effectively and also with products and services that were available at that time yeah. they put themselves into these ad campaigns which some of which were so famous even people who are around today would not remember them but know of them well like the vw bug ad that's floating yeah. and, exactly. and actually it's interesting because this is the old line agency and, and don draper goes that's a terrible yeah. ad. Yeah, 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 yeah. And there's all there's a, there's a Mustang thing in there somewhere. There's uh, you know the yeah. different uh, all Love the it. different companies that they represent. Very so. interesting. So obviously the way that companies interacted with customers or consumers in the '60s, the very early '60s, when the show takes place, there was a change going on then. It was it's probably a thing that has evolved over time. Of course, I mean again, this is not a market that I I don't follow marketing or advertising per se, but. Now, as we move forward to this technology industry, such as it is, technology, of course, just gets integrated into everything. You know, um, I would, you know, as a as an enthusiast growing up, I was the type of guy who would uh, wanted a computer as soon as I could get one. Whereas I had friends who were, were maybe into sports and other things solely and couldn't have cared less about computers. But today, because of the way these things have evolved, they all own computers. They all own smartphones. They all owned and probably don't anymore because of smartphones, but owned iPods of some kind, digital cameras, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, Microsoft as a company from the 70s, right, uh, has had to evolve with the times. And I think Microsoft did fine. Microsoft, you know, they were a leader in many ways. There was a time period where you could say they weren't so much leading in the sense that they weren't the ones coming up with the ideas, but they would they would almost formalize a notion by adopting some kind of technology for themselves. So for example, they didn't come up with the GUI. Apple had the spectacular fla uh, you know, flash with the, the Mac, but didn't really sell in any huge volume. And then Microsoft was able to popularize oh, yeah. it. They made it, went, made it made it successful in it, the real world. Yeah, so even that is an accomplishment, of Hell course. Yeah. Because, but the fear now is that they're not even able, they're not really even doing that. Now there are 
things that stand contrary to that. I would argue that Microsoft has done a very effective job moving some of the legacy products forward to cloud computing, whether we're talking about Windows Azure or their hosted versions of SharePoint and Exchange, uh, especially their first steps into web-based versions of Office, which I think are excellent. Um, you know, there, there's a balancing act. You can't just drop the products you have today because you can kind of see the future and you know where things are going. I mean, um, just because the plane was invented didn't mean that people stopped using trains. In fact, the United States may be an anomaly. This is something I know nothing about, so I'm just speaking off the top of my head, but it wouldn't surprise me to discover that train use worldwide as a percentage of the population or whatever has actually risen worldwide, hmm, interesting. despite the fact that there are planes. I'm just guessing, having visited Europe, because Europe is riddled with train tracks. Yeah. And so I know is Eastern uh, Asia. So the United States, I think, is a, I think just because of our history and, the, and our whole Wild West mentality and our, the amount of space we have, I think that the automobile was a bigger deal here or whatever. But, you know, I think, uh, you know, Microsoft has to, uh, you know, embrace the future as well as maintain the past. And I think that this is the balancing act that they're not necessarily doing. I think, you know, you give, I give them so much credit uh, yeah. because they, you, you hit the nail on the head. Apple did the GUI in 84, but Microsoft formalized the platform in a way that everybody was comfortable with it and could develop to it. I don't, they, they, maybe didn't invent the personal computer revolution, but they standardized it in a way yeah. that it could take off. They, they were the Winchester rifle. They were the, the, yeah. you know, the, the standardization of this, without which I don't think you see the revolution that we've seen. But there's a right. downside to that. Once you become a standard, you're frozen. Yes. It, it, you can see it in so many different places, too. And um, it, with regards to Microsoft, you, know, you see it in, obviously in Windows, you see it in IE, you see it in Office in some ways. You know, Microsoft killed a very early project. I mean, and you can make all the excuses you want in a Monday morning quarterback sense, but there were people within Microsoft who saw the future, wanted to do what was essentially a web-based version of Office. Like a, it was actually an ActiveX-based version of Office, but essentially something that would have been very forward-leaning for the day. And it was squashed because the, the people in charge of the traditional Office product were, so, were and still are so powerful at the company that they saw that as competition from within. And I mean, that's a, that's a dicey position to be in, right? I mean, it, you know, Windows is very powerful at Microsoft Server, Office, obviously. I mean, what if there's another little part of Microsoft where they're making something that in some ways could compete with one of those core products? You know, how does Microsoft right. rectify that? I think this is, this is a universal challenge. And I think it's one of the reasons businesses rise and fall. There are not that sure. many businesses that can reinvent themselves every few and the problem that you know no there aren't uh, and and uh, you know there are companies like uh, we can think of technology companies today especially japanese companies it's kind of interesting uh nintendo and sega and those companies all started as something else nintendo was a made, playing card company yeah so they made their way forward uh into electronics and right. into video games and so forth but if you were to look at you know just to beat the train example to death if you were look, to look at any of the major transportation companies in the late 1800s or the car, the car companies that were around in the early 1900s, many of them just ceased to exist. They they didn't make the transition. They're not right. you know they're not flying space shuttles up to the moon now or something. They're you know they, a lot of them unfortunately get overrun by smaller, faster, new types of competitors in those new markets. You know I think this is just the fear from Microsoft essentially. Um, yeah, it even, might be, but that's the uh, yeah. you know it's it's. it's the problem is that we're seeing uh, what normally is in a much larger time scale, in a very compressed time scale, because technology, and, and this may be the way it is in going forward with every sure. kind of business, but technology moves so quickly. Yep. It iterates so quickly. Now, I'm looking at Intel. It's interesting because Intel yesterday uh, revealed a, a part of their roadmap with a new transistor and this new Ivy Bridge technology, which will be out this time next year or maybe a little sooner. Uh, right. And, and they have reinvented themselves. It's kind of interesting. Well, okay. So first of all, <laughs> I would say that they say they have reinvented well, that's themselves. Let's be, let's be clear there. <laughs> that's a good there point. Is, there is some debate. And I think that this is very interesting because if you were to criticize the intel of the past decade, one of the things, from a technical standpoint, one of the things you could have brought up was that megahertz war thing that they were right. involved in, the megahertz war. Um, they were going after ever faster clock speeds yeah. at a time and really... It bit them in the butt. Didn't work. Yeah, eventually did, right? 
So there was a, they had a design group, I think, from Israel that came up with the core processors, and they had to basically adopt that as their replacement for those uh, the Pentium class processors from before the old x86 processors, mm -hmm. whatever. Um, there is a, a school of thought with this new type of processor that you're talking about, that, or this new type of transistor, these the so-called 3D design, where you can only make something so thin and, and spread out, you know, horizontally, if you will, that, you know, eventually you also have to spread out vertically. And that, that's sort of what they're doing here with the number of transistors. And it's allowing them to adhere to this Moore's Law thing. Um, some critics are saying that this is just the old performance first mistake that they made in the past. Mm, interesting. That they're just doing it again. Now, Intel is very quick to push the power savings of such a design. But I think this is something we're going to have to wait and see because the problem for Intel is the same for Microsoft. There's a lot of new markets occurring now. And when you look at all these powerful, small, highly mobile and connected devices, you can't find any that are running on Intel microprocessors. None. ARM owns it. <coughs> right. So... Uh, this is a huge problem uh, for Intel. I agree. It's in some ways the same problem that Microsoft faces. You know, that this industry that it essentially created on its own is now heading in a different direction. And how they react to this challenge will determine their future, mm -hmm. essentially. So I guess we'll see. It's, I th I, to me, it's maybe I'm too business focused. You know, I didn't used to care about business at all, but now that I have one, I kind of yeah. got, got a little interested. Sure, sure. Uh, but I, I, to me, it's a, just a, it's a, it's a, it should be a case study in business school. I mean, it should be it, kind of the one of the fundamental well, questions of, our, of the these decade. Will, although, you know, I think to the outside world, this stuff isn't necessarily interesting. There, there was a small period in time there where AMD was on top of the world from an architectural or a technical standpoint. That's right. They came out with what became known as the X64 platform. Um, they, they took advantage of, of Intel's failures, frankly. Right, because Intel had uh, partnered with HP and I think other companies to come up with the Itanium as the future of the microprocessor. This was their 64-bit gambit, essentially. A completely new design. It was, it was horribly inefficient and uh, there were all kinds of problems with it. But AMD, as sort of the low-end, uh, you know, smaller player, looked at what was then and actually is still now the mainstream uh, microprocessor platform, the x86 platform, and said, what if we just added 64-bit extensions to this, you know? rather than create something new, because they really didn't probably have the resources to do that, let's just build off of what we already have. Now, that sounds technically, um, you know, less sophisticated, but they got an early endorsement from the Windows server guys, Dave Cutler and company, all the guys who are working on the X64 stuff, uh, well, I'm sorry, now the X64 stuff, the 64-bit stuff. You know, remember, they were working with the digital stuff, they were working with Itanium, they were working with, I think, MIPS uh, at one point as well looking for some 64-bit platform that made sense because obviously, especially with servers, servers are going to go there first. They need that for scalability. And when AMD came around, I don't think anyone would have bet on these guys, but they saw that and liked what they saw. Plus, it was compatible with everything they already had. It was so easy. Yeah. You know? So good, ultimately, or so successful that Intel had to basically just adopt it themselves. That's a, that was a humbling thing, I'm sure, for Intel. And that's why Not competition is so important. I'm just going to point that out. If it weren't for AMD, Intel's processors would not be as good, as fast, as cheap. <laughs> sure. AMD is probably really excited to hear you Yeah, say that, thank right? you, AMD. You put you threw yourself on the cross. Thanks now, by the way, into, yeah. thank ARM. Because if it sure. weren't for ARM completely owning the mobile space, Intel probably, well, well, I, we'll I see. don't know. Well, we'll see. You know, there, there have been... Wake up calls for Microsoft, you know, the internet tidal wave and so forth. Yeah. Microsoft said they put Windows on ARM. They're going to put Windows on ARM. Yeah. So these companies are both reacting now to these trends that yeah. they had nothing to do with. Yeah. Um, and, and their reactions to these trends and their reactions to what's happening in the market will, you know, again, determine their future. It's, <laughs> it, See, it's you exciting. Made this, you made and, this know. exciting, even though it's boring as hell. You, <laughs> you, my friend. <laughs> yeah. Made well, it exciting. There you go. <laughs> We're going to take a break. Uh, it's what I do, Leo. It's what I do. It's what Paul Therott does. He makes the boring exciting. And I make the exciting boring. <laughs> Whatever it is, like, my job is basically just to kill the buzz either way. Tinker Toy Tech says, I want to hear about Windows Home Server, so we will talk about that. Mm -hmm. uh, we will hear about the LastPass hack. There's a lot more to talk about in just a second. Paul Therat is here, editor-in-chief of the Super Site for Windows at winsupersite.com and the uh, 
News editor for Windows IT Pro, author of Windows Phone Secrets, and much, much more. Before we go much farther, though, i got to tell you about Netflix. I was really happy when Netflix said, yeah, we'll, we'll sponsor uh, Windows Weekly. I was like, finally, because I've been a Netflix user for 11 years, and I've been trying, I have literally, I always thought these would be the perfect advertiser. Of course, that was when we started six years ago. I think everybody's now a Netflix user. <laughs> <laughs> so... Um, if you're already a Netflix user, did you know that you can make mom a Netflix user? Hey, there you go. There's something. Uh, tell mom about this offer. She could try it free. If she says, I like it, then it's a great... I give my mom Netflix every year on her birthday, a year's worth of Netflix. It's such a great deal. She loves it. It's the gift that keeps on giving. She loves movies. It's really fun for her. When I first did it, I, uh, I bought her a TV and a DVD player, and I gave her the Netflix subscription. It comes in the email. It's great. It's easy. And it was perfect. Because she didn't have a DVD player. So suddenly she's watching movies. But that was quite a few years ago. Now we've got the Netflix watch instantly. I, I could save some money. It's only seven ninety nine a month. So, Mom, your birthday present just got cheaper. Because she tells me she loves watching instantly. So here's the deal. Tell Mom or Sis or Brother or Dad or Grandpa or Grandma or whoever that you know doesn't have Netflix. Say, go to Netflix.com slash twit. And try it free for 30 days. Play with, and this will include DVDs too. That you know, this was their original businesses. You know, DVDs by mail, and as little as one business day, you get to keep them as long as you want, no late fees. And then when you're done, you send it back in their prepaid postage mailer, and you get the next one on your on your list. You have a queue. But the watch instantly, I think, has changed the game. This is the future, really, of uh, of watching. And you know, this in this case, what I would have given mom is instead of giving her a DVD player and a TV, I'd have given her a Roku box. Uh, she actually has a PlayStation 3 for the grandkids, so she could do it on her PlayStation 3. You could do it on an Xbox 360, a Nintendo Wii, on any PC or Mac, and uh, even uh, on many Blu-ray players and televisions themselves now have Netflix. It's kind of the, it's kind of the thing. Ooh, all that jazz! I loved that movie. That obscure object of desire. They have classics. They have new stuff. Look, The Graduate. Remember that? What you know? It's kind of fun for me to browse. I don't even like use the queue so much because I I'm say what am I in the mood for? And then a, a witty romantic comedy. I'd look in the list of witty romantic comedies. Arthur, you know they got the new Arthur coming out, but really there was nothing funnier than Dudley Moore in the old one. Funny Girl, How to Marry a Millionaire. But then modern movies too. The other guys that with Will Ferrell. I missed that. Gotta watch that. Mark Wahlberg and Will Ferrell. Uh, Salt. Even you know. Big movies like The Lord of the Rings uh, in high def. Can you believe the, the... This can't be right. The original... The first Lord of the Rings came out in 2001? <laughs> Can that be right? Ten years ago? Yep. We're getting old. Holy cow. And now, now Jax is doing The Hobbit. Um, Easy A. I missed that in the theaters a couple of months ago. It's already on Netflix, so I can watch it instantly. The But then... TV shows like the original Twilight Zone, 138 episodes. How many times have you been in a conversation and you say, hey, remember that earwig episode of the Twilight Zone? Or you remember that Twilight Zone where the guy was in the town and there was nobody else? You can go back and you could find individual episodes and watch them. It, it, you know, they've got the descriptions of each episode. So you can, all five of the of the original seasons are on here. And you could just watch that individual episode. Oh, that was such a good one. Remember that one, The Last Rites of Jeff Myrtlebank? <laughs> Occurrence at Owl Creek Bridge. There's such... I'm sorry. I'm calm down now. Netflix.com slash twit. If you are not a Netflix member, I don't... Well, I don't know how that happened, but quick. Join your friends and, uh, and get it free for 30 days, and then you'll see why we love it so much. And if you are a member, tell your friends. 30 days free, Mom. 30 days free, Dad. And if you like it, maybe you'll get it for uh, Mother's Day, huh? Netflix.com slash twit. We love Netflix. We thank you for their support of Windows Weekly. <laughs> I, went, I, went, I, I had to laugh. I, was, I went down the stairs uh, and, you know, uh, Microsoft, uh, RIM announced the, um, the new uh, 9900 BlackBerry, which looks pretty sweet. In fact, I'm actually yep. tempted to get it. I am too. It looks good. And uh, some, and I think it was Colin, our newest employee, said, "Hey, good news! BlackBerry's got Bing." <laughs> <laughs> it does have Bing. So what's the deal? Well, 
Microsoft's uh, CEO, Steve Ballmer, appeared on stage at RIM's BlackBerry World conference in Florida this week, which caused a bit of a stir. I bet, because uh, uh, this is a competing platform. Yeah. But, you know, what people forget is that Microsoft doesn't just make Windows Phone. They also have all these other platforms. And one of the things that they've been very busy doing over the years is try to get Bing on as many mobile platforms yeah. as possible. It's so, on the iPhone. It's actually great it's on the on, iPhone. Right. They, they had a deal with Apple to put it on the iPhone. It's on most Google Android, or it's available on Google Android phones, often by default through wireless carriers. That's right. Like That's right. Um, so obviously, it's on Windows Phone. So this was just them getting Bing um, on on BlackBerry, you know, but and going forward. Is it we'll kind of a plan B in case Windows Phone is a flop? No. How does this help Microsoft with smartphones? I mean, it's I just, it's, <laughs> it has nothing to do with smartphones. I right. mean, you know, the plan B would be we buy RIM, I guess. You know? <laughs> no, that's a bad plan so. B. Yeah, I think so too. But. Don't do that. How is how are Windows Phone sales going? I mean, there's I've seen uh, wildly <laughs> varying numbers. Uh, yeah, so it depends on who you ask. So Microsoft it, it, it did was, not say say anything at the on the on the call uh, last week. No, and I no, they didn't. They so had. they had obviously they have their earnings statement, their announcement. They have various data associated with that, and then they have a Q and A with analysts and press. And right. I poured over the transcript just to see if there was any mention, and it was really just a minimal. Mentioned certainly no numbers. Um, you know, th there's always stupidity around this kind of stuff, which I find unfortunate. But there was an analyst from Russia who no one outside of the Nokia world has ever heard of, who said that Windows phone sales were catastrophic. Was his yeah. quote? Uh -huh. He estimated they were somewhere in the six hundred and seventy thousand range, which is ludicrous. Um, the, unfortunately, the way our world works is that. Every tech blogger and even often credible news reporters in the tech world wrote a headline that said, Windows phone sales catastrophic, as if this was suddenly a fact. But uh, there's no way it's that low. So yeah, I don't know what to say to that. Other than this week, too, uh, um, Canal, Canalis, uh, who I have heard of, came out with their smartphone numbers for the quarter. And according to them, uh, Windows Phone has actually sold uh, 2.5 million units. Um, and those are shipments of Windows Phone devices to consumers. Those are not oh, ship, shipping that's, into the That's channel. not in the channel. That's uh, no. all the way. I think that's closer to reality. So That's a good number. Uh, not because it's a higher number, because it's more credible. Right. You know. So it's okay. It's okay. I think Apple sells that many every time Steve Jobs sneezes or whatever. <laughs> but, you know you got to take what you can take. Uh, moving along, um, a thin PC. <laughs> Who's yeah. that from? You're talking about like uh, a thin client? Windows thin PC. Uh, it's, a, it's, a window, it's a version of Windows 7, uh, an embedded version of Windows 7. Oh, interesting. Aimed at legacy PCs. So my, Microsoft currently sells a product called Windows Fundamentals for legacy PCs, which is such a wonderful Microsoft name for product, right? Um, <laughs> It came out right before Vista shipped. It's and it was based Wiffle. W F F L P. Wiffle. Wiffle. Yeah. Win 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 flip or whatever. <laughs> win flip. <laughs> so it's funny, my printer just came on and my screen flashed. I thought I was gonna lose power or something. So this is a it, it is an interesting idea. It's basically a way to get an embedded version of Windows on an older PC. It's obviously aimed at, co at corporations, but also educational institutions and libraries and so forth, places where you really want to lock down computers. And I had to have a lot of them. And it's just a way for these people to reuse the hardware resources they've already paid for, right? So it's a good idea. Uh, the version that's in the market right now is based on Windows XP, which is kind of a bad idea. And of course, there was no version of this for Windows Vista because Windows Vista was just too big, you know, of an OS. So one of the nice things about Windows 7 is they further componentized it, made it into a smaller, lighter system. And now there are embedded versions of this, which are actually really efficient. So uh, Windows Thin PC is an embedded version of Windows 7 aimed at these environments. It's replacing, um, you know, Windows fundamentals for legacy PCs. It will ship sometime this summer. <coughs> Excuse me. I thought it was over my cough, but <clears throat> I think this is now allergies. But Week 8, <laughs> Paul Therott's throat yeah. held hostage. It's a little dry. Sorry about that. Um, you know, I, I feel like there's an opportunity missed here. Um, Windows Thin PC requires a, a software assurance license, a, it basically a volume license agreement with Microsoft. It's um, So it's sold that way. It's obviously sold to 
You can picture big corporate environments where they have a bunch of these old, uh, let's say, Dell PCs from the mid 2000s sitting around that really aren't up to date and so forth. So um, it has low end requirements. You know, gigahertz or faster PC, one gig of RAM, and only 16 gigabytes of hard disk space. Um, it has some interesting lockdown capabilities. There are write filters so that you, the people using the system can never actually write anything to the hard disk if you want to lock it down in that way. So it's, it's very, um, it's extremely modular. You know, the system as it installs has very little on it. Uh, so it's small and fast and light. But I have to wonder if this wouldn't be an awesome uh, basis for like a home theater type system, right? Where you could have this really stripped down version of Windows 7 running on what is essentially a net top computer out in your living room. And just that basic system with, say, Media Center on top of it. Uh, with a remote control would be kind of a cool thing to have in the living room. Now, you can't use this particular product for that purpose because it requires um, uh, the types of um, activation servers that you would have in a corporation and so forth. But it seems like it would be easy to to do, and I'm kind of surprised they're not doing that. But, you know, whatever, Microsoft's doing whatever they do. So this is kind of a cool product. So if you were looking uh, for something for a large environment, we had a lot of older computers, you know, uh, charities and, and educate, you know, libraries and schools and, and places where money is always at a premium. Um, this is something to look forward to. So there's a release candidate that's out now. You can down, anyone can go grab it just to take a look at it. Um, and then I think the final version is June or July is sometime in the, in the future. But, um, you know, something, something to check out if you're, if you have such a need. So, uh, yeah. yeah, cause you don't want to put, I mean, if you have a, I guess a core two, you could put seven on, but if you had the Pentium four or uh, something like that, you're not going to play yeah, I mean, modern version. Pentium 3, you know, like, a, I, I don't remember the numbers anymore, but I'm sure the Pentium 3 went up to 1 gigahertz. You know, I'm, I know it was in the upper hundreds there. Um, you know, what would today would be considered a pretty laughable processor would be enough. The other, the other thing this enables, if you have, and, and this requires some serious infrastructure, but if you have a lot of the, the very latest version of Windows Server in the back end with a special graphics cards that can handle this, and again, this is a very uh, kind of a specialty install, um, you can actually run, uh, you know, run this thing remotely to these now now thin clients with all the arrow effects and graphics and hardware acceleration and all that stuff. It's 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 pretty it's pretty powerful if you have that infrastructure. <coughs> Excuse me. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, let's see. Moving along, um, I'm I'm holding off of the Windows Home Server because. I really, I really. Yes, you know, you know, people are waiting for uh, it. Yeah, it's, a t it's. I'm, I'm, te I'm mean. I'm teasing them. God, oh, you're such a jerk. I'm such a jerk. Tech toy tuper duper, whatever your name is. Well, what is it they want to know? I mean, I'm not even sure. Well, you I'm have a note to... here. Uh, it, yes. Just if you said, it would probably be sufficient if you just said Windows Home Server. Twenty. Windows Home Server is awesome. I love it. Thank you. Moving Can on. <laughs> SharePoint. <laughs> you know, hey, I got my invitation to the Office 365 beta. I'm excited. You did? Oh, good. Yeah, includes SharePoint. That's cool. Yeah, I've been talking to the SharePoint guys a lot. I, I, I intend to use this um, product, SharePoint Online, specifically in Office 365, going forward regularly. Um, I have had kind of an eye-opening experience to SharePoint. I've, I've always known about it, of course. It's been around forever. It's actually been around for 10 years. But it is astonishing what this thing can do. And the way that it has evolved over time is actually really interesting because it, what it's turned into is is a, it, it is not just a document library, you know, a, a document portal or an employee portal, like sort of a, uh, the types of sites that people would create as intranets, but it's also uh, turned into something that is very easy to create, you know, what we would call extranets or just public websites. And oh, I didn't know like that. Any, I did not know that. I've been using it to share files. Yeah. Right. So you can create amazing public websites with wow. this thing. And, and that's the point. I call it a Swiss Army Knife uh, platform. It's hard to give an elevator pitch for SharePoint because it does so much. It's so versatile. But it is absolutely incredible. And, you know, Raphael and I have been going over SharePoint uh, to use this in the context of our next book. You know, one of the things that we're going to do, we're, when you consider the two of us as, as maybe the smallest possible company on earth, uh, <laughs> but we can collaborate on documents in real time using SharePoint. We can host our own meetings and do all that stuff. We, we do video and, and uh, whiteboarding and application or desktop sharing. We can uh, share live notes. So we can both contribute to a, a OneNote based notebook that's hosted on SharePoint. We can both be in there live at the same time, making changes, talking about it over link, which is also part of Office 365. 
Um, it is such an amazing collaboration tool. And I, I guess before, you know, Office 365 is not available in final form. It's in a public beta right now, but sometime this year, it will ship in a, a public form. And Hey, it's free now, that, which is nice. Yeah, so for small businesses or individuals, the cost of this thing is going to be $6 per month, uh, you know, per user. Um, that sounds like a lot, you know, $72 a year. But, you know, compared to the paid version of Google Apps, it's actually pretty competitive. My argument simply is that the capabilities are so much more incredible than what you get through the Google stuff, that it's something people should look at regardless. So it's, you know, the full version of Exchange, 25 gigabytes of storage, all of those capabilities that you get through Exchange, you know, the full version of SharePoint uh, 2010 and Link Online. I mean, it's it's really an amazing set of capabilities. And again, as, as I've learned more about Exchange, uh, I'm sorry, about SharePoint, um, because it's the one, it's the product of those three that I really just had the, the loosest grip on. I'm continually amazed by how powerful this thing is and how much stuff is there. And, and again, I'll be writing more about this in the future, but um, it's just an amazing, amazing tool. And I, now with Office 365, it's not going to be just for huge corporations. Right. It's gonna, individuals can use it. And by the way, for all of the angst and complaining, if that's what you want to call it about Microsoft, the one thing that this company has always done really well is taking technology that was previously the purview of only the you know, the elites or the, the white suited lab guys and bringing it down to normal people. And this is a great example of that. And it, it, and what they're doing with Office 365, I think is pretty exciting. Yeah, I, I, I was real thrilled when I got it. It's a little confusing. We talked about this last week because I thought, oh, it's not for me as an individual. It's for business. And but well, of course, good. you, you can start it with this. Yeah, it right. is for you. They, they act like, you know, it's a small business edition, but it works fine as an individual. Well, it's, it's small business and, and IT pros. Yeah. So I signed up for it as a twit. So I, so our is, what is it? It's twit.off, online office or office, whatever it is, on a, mm -hmm. um, dot com. And that's, uh, so that way, if I do decide this is what we want to use for the company, it's right. an easy thing. I've already got the account. We just make it, uh, make it global. Yeah, I mean, if you, if you, and you have a real company, so actually yeah, you I actually have, have a company, <laughs> oh, but that, but that it brings additional functionality and options. So for example, you have X number of employees or people that you want to access this right. stuff. There are other options that are actually less expensive per user that some people can have if that's all they need. So for example, if you, you have kiosk type users with less need of uh, email storage and so forth and web-based access to the office apps and all that, um, those things can actually be had. Uh, for less money per month, as it turns out. So there are additional opportunities from a licensing standpoint, if you will, uh, for those who go with the enterprise option instead of the small business option. Uh, let's see. You do, you do have an, an item in your, in your rundown here saying choosing between Windows Home Server and Small Business Server. I do. So I think just, if you're, a, I'm, I'm going to guess, but if you're a home <laughs> user, you'd choose the home version. Yeah. If you're small business, you might want the small business version. Is that not clear? That is an interesting way to look at it. <laughs> um, it is probably accurate. I would say that out of the box, I, I think the big difference, there are two big differences. Um, one is that small business server, I should have written essentials there, by the way. Small business server 2011 essentials, ah. which is based on the same code base as Windows Home Server uh, 2011. The has... Uh, support for and very simplified support for Active Directory style domains. I don't mean web domains, right? I don't mean like URLs. I mean um, uh, domains in the traditional, um, not work group, you know, internal sense. I mean uh, a way to organize users and uh, and other objects like PCs and, and policies and so forth. Um, Windows Home Server does not. So Windows Home Server right there is a little simpler. Although I have again. As far as domain access goes and all that stuff, I mean, Small Business Server has a nice, uh, it's very simple. It's not like using a, a full-blown version of Windows Server. The other thing is that out of the box, Windows Home Server comes with something that Small Business Server doesn't, which is really nice media sharing capabilities. If all you're looking for is a place to store files on a central server that you can access in a very normal sense through Windows, uh, any, either one of these things will do the trick. But if you want to blast uh, media out to a, say, an Xbox 360, or, um, you know, one of those uh, WDTV type devices or, you know, a Windows PC running uh, Windows Media Player or Windows Media Center, Windows Home Server is the, is the one to get. The thing that's coming in Small Business Server, which, by the way, should work sort of at least with Windows Home Server, is um, integration with Office 365. 
So if you have a domain in your in your small business, like you have a small business, um, where you actually have an Active Directory domain hosted on, uh, say, Small Business Server Essentials, you could link it to Office 365, and it would would integrate the identities of your users with their email accounts and their SharePoint permissions and their link uh, capabilities in the cloud. So there's integration coming um, through an add-in. So uh, both of these things can be extended through add-ins and the add-ins are compatible across the board. Um, there may be some add-ins that only work on one or the other because of the underlying you know, capabilities or whatever. So this just came out of a question someone had asked me and uh, this particular person had no uh, experience running a server. If that is your <laughs> case as well, I would say go with Windows Home Server because it's very, very, very simple. Okay. Or if you're in a home, just use the home version. And if you're in a business, use the business version. Right. I, you know, so, but for a lot of us, that's... I'm, I'm just teasing. Well, no, but it's you explain it's it. a little more complicated than that, right? Yes. I work at home, but I work at you're home. You're a business. So I am in, in many ways a business. Yeah, so a small how do I... Business. Very small. Yes. <laughs> One person. Uh, but the, but the, but that means how you use it is different than how a home user would use it. It could be, but I think in, in, in it, well, it, what it comes down to for me is which is more important, right? Right. right. Um, like I said, both of these servers can store documents, and I can access them from any Windows PC. So from that standpoint, either one of these would be fine. I, I, arguably, having a domain in some ways would be kind of nice, but frankly, because of the number, you know the the way I do things and testing and so forth. I mean, I kind of have to have non-domain mm -hmm. user accounts and capabilities just to know how those things work. So that's kind of a wash. But it, the home uh, media sharing and media sharing outside of the home as well, because you can go past the firewall. Those capabilities in Windows Home Server, to me, put it over the top. So it, that is what I use and uh, will be what I use going forward. Hey, let's see here. I guess uh, um, we talked about the microprocessor. So uh, yep. the next story is the Sony update. Then we'll get your picks of the week. And by the way, uh, LastPass, which is just broke this morning. And yep. uh, a program note, Steve Gibson, uh, our security guy and an expert on LastPass, he actually did a whole show on LastPass, will be on TNT this afternoon with Tom Merritt at 2.30 okay. uh, 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 Pacific. He'll probably be able to have a more intelligent conversation than I can, actually, but... Well, I, you know, I'm a LastPass not only user but advocate. I mean, I, Me I've, yeah. I've gone on record big time saying you got to have it, you got to have it, and I think they've handled this very well. Now, I don't know exactly what the breach is, and Steve will talk about that. Well, unlike Sony, these guys came forward immediately, immediately, and they gave and so you. A, we a, don't know what's going on yet, but right. here's our, you know, what we think, and here's our recommendation and all that kind right. of stuff. I mean, my problem with this stuff is true whether you're talking about the Apple tracking stuff on the iPhone or the PlayStation Network stuff, or uh, Amazon's cloud outage that they had uh, that we talked about last week, or now this last pass thing. Anytime something like this happens, all of these knee-jerk reactions from the I can't let go of my USB key crowd, you know, where it's like, see, you told you cloud computing wasn't secure, eh, you know, um, to which I would just uh, simply say, look, it, the most insecure thing you can do online, other than just run Windows without any antivirus or whatever, would be to sign up with the exact same email account and password on every single site that you visit <laughs> yeah. because all what it takes is one of those things to be hacked and then they have your exact login credentials for everything. Now, the problem with what I just said is that is what everyone does, right? Right. You, that, I mean, when, when I say everyone, I don't mean literally everyone, but, but statistically, yeah. almost everyone. So, so how do you get around that, you know? Some people have these little schemes, and by the way, I have a scheme like this where I make a password and that is sort of based on the site or has something to do with the site, so it's a little bit different. Um, I try to do stuff like that. Or you can use something like LastPass where it creates extremely complex passwords to your requirements, by the way, um, that you never need to know what the password is because this thing can then log you in. Now, of course, in this case, you have a single point of failure where if LastPass is hacked, Potentially, people could access that information. Now, of course, they store it with encryption and, you know, there's all these safeguards and so forth. But I find uh, for myself, and I still recommend that that kind of a scheme, that particular scheme actually, is still obviously vastly superior to manually doing this yourself. Because it's impossible 
to manually do it yourself to this level of effectiveness. So I guess we'll see what happens, but I, I you know, <clears throat> you know, even when you compare it to um, locally installed and hard to manage um, password savers or whatever they're called, you know, RoboForm or whatever. I mean, this is, it, it, it's just a better system. Oh, I so love like LastPass. Yeah. Um, as of now, I'm just looking on the LastPass site. You know, what they recommended yeah. is that everybody change their master password, the way LastPass works. So, of course, everyone tried to. <laughs> and, and the site's, you know, jammed. Yeah. So it's logging people in on offline mode, which, which, which it still works. You still it's have fine. your database. Uh, and it's not compromised. Um, and you'll be no, able to and it's local to, on your machine, by the way. So if you have right. this thing installed, you have a cache version of it that's encrypted and so forth. Right. So you don't have to connect to the server. It still works. So, uh, you know, I think that it's, it was designed from day one to yep. weather this kind of uh, breach. Uh, and I, th I think you're still secure. I wouldn't worry. Unlike Sony, where <laughs> you're, you're screwed. <laughs> I, by the way, if you, you know, if, if you want a lesson in how not to handle not to things, handle it. Oh, yeah. Sony is it. And the thing I love about, I shouldn't say love, I mean, the thing I find most amazing about this whole event is how every day, not only does the story change, but more details come out. And these guys are just so clueless. It, it's it's irresponsible. I mean, it's it's unbelievably irresponsible. And of course, there are class action lawsuits. You know, surprise, surprise. But I, I think we must have first talked about this last week. I mean, given the timing, and I think I would have said at the time that this is something that's going to change over time, and that every day there's going to be new news, and it's going to get worse. There has been no good news. I can tell you that it's worse, been all worse. bad news. Yeah. So it's. <laughs> The estimates of the number of credit cards that were stolen keeps going up. and it, Well, it just, a wholly separate system, Sony Online Entertainment, apparently wasn't. Yeah. And so really, they got that one, too. They blamed a group, you know, this uh, group called That's Anonymous. Yes. And those guys have said, no, we did not do this. So I, I think, what, but unfortunately, this event also highlights a lack of sophistication on Sony's part because it's likely that whatever group or individual did hack into Sony might have left a message or something indicating that they were anonymous, this group anonymous, and that that was the information that they used to publicly announce that that's who it was. Right. When, in fact, that's not the case. So, once again, you know, they've just been made to look silly. Yeah, just morons. Yeah. Good stuff. Jeez. Just glad, you know, I can't buy Sony stock. I'd be really irate right now. Wait, what's the what's the yeah? If I don't own any Sony stock, how can I how could I do something with the stock that would harm them? In some way? You know, <laughs> is there some way I could you know trigger short a sell, sell it? So, short yeah. sell it. Idiots. Ah. All right, we're gonna take a break. We uh, I want to do an audible uh, ad. You yep. have three, not one, not two, but three audible picks. So let me tell you a little bit about audible, folks, and then we'll uh, we'll explain why we do these picks. Uh, because the truth is, uh, audible.com is just simply the best online bookstore for audio entertainment anywhere. I mean, just love audible.com. You've probably heard us talk about it before. I'm an audible user from, uh, uh, a decade ago. I started when I had that long commute. You know, if you get a long commute, there's nothing worse. If you're, if you're somebody who, you know, after, uh, you know, a year, the radio pales, you got podcasts, but wouldn't it be nice to even listen to great literature? I was talking with my daughter, Abby, uh, the other night, and she said, we, we were talking about something. She said, well, as, as Virginia Woolf said in On the Lighthouse, and I said, what? She said, you haven't read? She, she's so dismissive. You haven't read On the Lighthouse? I said, no, but I'll read it tonight. And I got it immediately on uh, Audible, and, and it's a wonderful uh, listen. Classic book written in 1927, and that's kind of the beauty of this is... Uh, it's a bookstore that you can go to and instantly get a book. I've kind of gotten used to that with the Kindle. This is, uh, by the way, the new Kindle. I just got the $114 ad-supported Kindle. It has all your Audible library books on there as well. So another way to listen to Audible books without syncing it to a computer, you, you can either read a book on the Kindle or listen to your favorite books on a Kindle using audible.com. Uh, 70,000 titles. And we're going to get you your first one free. All you have to do is go to audible.com slash windows. You'll sign up for that book a month gold account, which is a great way to start. And then uh, and then the good news is your first month's free, your first book's free, and it's yours to keep forever. You can cancel at any time, so you don't have to pay a penny, and you're going to get this book free. Now, the bad news is Paul's got three books you're going to want to listen to. 
and very timely books too. What are your picks, Paul? I see one is called the Bin Ladens. Yeah, I don't know if you guys are following the news, but something happened. I don't know. I guess there was some kind of a something raid or some foofer. Anyway, uh, yeah, you know, I, I've only read one of these three books. The, the recommendations here, uh, three books about uh, Al Qaeda and the Bin Ladens and so forth, um, all came from the New York Times, which uh, did a little retrospective of books that you know it recommended uh, for this topic. And see, the beauty um, of this is now Audible has such a good library that this is even they're all Audible. There. Yeah. Um, the one I have read is called The Longest War by Peter Bergen, and I know he is, in fact, working on what he's described as the definitive book about the uh, the end of this story, the raid that uh, took Bin Laden's. I can't so wait to read. I want to yeah, know the details. Yeah. Boy. But as, as happens in historical events like this, as these things unfold, you know, you want to learn more about the background story and, right. and, and all that. So I can say, having read it, The Longest War is fantastic. But the other two books are The Bin Ladens by Steve Cole. And he actually has a... That guy has another book about Bin Laden as well. I don't have listed here. And well, then, it's interesting because uh, Osama Bin Laden was kind of the black sheep of the family. The the other rest of the family yeah, is Yeah, I mean, this of, is like... You know, it's <laughs> anytime... It, you, you watch a biography show about uh, a serial killer or something. These guys always have some kind of tortured past, as you might imagine. Um, and, in, yeah, in his case, uh, yeah, he was the run to the litter, actually. His family is quite well-known, uh, kind uh, of the Bechtel Corporation of, of uh, the Middle yeah. East. Yeah, you know, um, right. This was a guy who briefly considered uh, leaving terrorism to go into farming, by the way. And, uh, <laughs> oh, man. What a different but, world uh, that would have been, huh? <laughs> yeah. I think any of these, I, again, I haven't read two of them, but I, you know, I, they all look like good choices. Uh, Looming Tower by Lawrence Wright is the third one. Uh, so all three are inaudible. You're going to have to pick. Now, I think I agree with you. The Longest War is pretty amazing. That's uh, Peter Bergen. So uh, we can make that our recommendation. But, yep. uh, you know, you're going to have many great choices here at audible.com slash windows. Pick a book. And uh, make that your first listen. Pick something you're interested in because uh, this is going to be a test to see if you like audiobooks. I think you will. And uh, once you once you find Audible, you're just going to love it. They have great apps on uh, Android and iPhone, not yet on Windows Phone Seven. I can't wait till they get a good one on that. Uh, on the Kindle now, you can uh, when you get the new Kindle, it has all your Audible books, your whole library on it. Download any of your books and listen on the Kindle. On many other devices, including the Zune, audiblecom slash Windows. Of course, you can listen on your PC or Mac, too. Audible. So, by the way, I'm sorry. Slash Windows. Sorry about that. It's quite all right. I was going to say, before we move forward uh, to the tips and picks, um, I did want to address one more sort of news item, which is that you may recall we had talked in the past about uh, Chris Walsh had created an updater tool so that people who have Windows phones could get the no-do update right. you know, before Microsoft released it to uh, via certain carriers and so forth. Um Microsoft said at the time that people who use this update would be prevented from getting future updates because there was a... Right. Um, They'd been washed. Yeah. Well, I, you know, he created a tool that was based on the tool that Microsoft had and, you know, there was a piece missing or something and, yeah, um, you know, whatever. So uh, my feeling all along has been that uh, Chris or somebody else would, in fact, be able to fix this and that people looking down the road wouldn't have to worry about it. So when Mango comes out this fall, if that happens mm. unscheduled, they, there would be no worry that they would not be able to get the update. But obviously for the thousands of people who did use the update, this is a worry. And uh, what Chris Walsh announced this week was that he had, in fact, found the problem. Oh, good. And he is going to be releasing a tool Yay. Uh, that will um, fix this so that people who use the tool, the previous tool, uh, will be able to get future... Um, Updates now. The interesting thing about this really is that Microsoft has, in fact, confirmed this. So I'll just read you what they wrote. They said that um, the people who created this tool, Chris Wells, uh, believe they have created a way to get these phones back on the officially supported path. And we're going to work with them to validate the solution and applaud them for taking responsibility for doing this. So, um, long story short, Microsoft's going to work with them to make sure that this thing is okay. And at some point, uh, this updater will come out, and then. Anyone who washed their phones, as we call it, <laughs> will be able to uh, get on the right path, as Microsoft calls it. So whatever that means. But uh, anyway, so if you were kind of in limbo and worried about that, um, just know that there's a fix coming and everything's going to be fine. So no worries there. You've been washed. <laughs> exactly. 
Our well, windows. Was a joke. I, you know, I met him at Mix, and I said, "I got to make a shirt that says, you know, I got to Mix, and all I got was washed." <laughs> you know. Did he laugh? Yeah, he's yeah. a good guy. Good sense of humor. Yeah, you know, this has been good for him. Come on, let's face it. Um, yeah, overall, but I feel bad because. You know, Microsoft has really been kind of threatening to him. And, yeah. and here's a guy who's trying to really help out and show up for people and do the right thing and, and continuing to do the right thing, by the way, by, you know, now coming out with this fix. Like, I always knew he would basically do something like this. So um, I just feel bad. You know, Microsoft's reactions uh, to a lot of things with Windows Phone, unfortunately, have been over the top and unfortunate and undeserved, uh, not just for him, but for other people. And it's, you know, I would just hope that they would embrace guys like this um, who, who are trying to help the community, basically. I mean, that's really what this is all about. Let us uh, get our Windows Weekly tip of the week. Yeah, this one's from Matt uh, Battaglia. And this is interesting. I actually had, this is a problem I have had. So, for example, you have this digital camera. And th when you get it out of the box, you set the date and the time and all that stuff, and you set it up, and then you forget about it. But then you travel, maybe across time zones, like you go from Boston to California, you go on a vacation, you go to Europe or whatever it is, take a bunch of pictures, and then you get home and you realize, oh, I never changed the date and the time, and the phone didn't change the date and the time, and now all my pictures have the wrong date and time, and some of them were on the wrong days, and all that kind of stuff. And there's actually, you could actually do this in, um, in a Windows file system, I suppose, but there's actually kind of a neat functionality. I had to go and, he described this to me, and I had to kind of go and look at it, because I wasn't even really aware that it was there, but... If you go to the edit, you basically select any number of photos in Windows Live Photo Gallery and then go to the edit tab. And one of the buttons there is called adjust time. And what it allows you to do is just adjust. the. T you can change any aspects of the time and the date and the day of the week and all that stuff. And it tells you what the current time is for that image or images. And then you can just change them all in a big batch thing. So if you, if you just did the three-hour thing, all you do is change that, you know, Boston to California. So you're three hours behind, I guess, my less, you know, three hours less. You just change that hour slot, not the other parts of it, and it just changes all the photos accordingly. So it's kind of a, just a neat and quick way to, you know, um, batch update that kind, you know, that kind of metadata uh, that would be on the pictures. So that's kind of a cool little tip. This is something I wasn't really even aware of, even though it's sitting there staring at you uh, if you look hard enough. Image sizer dot. Oh, no, I'm sorry. That's next. That's I, I'm sorry. I'm this like, one, you just need Windows Live Photo Gallery. It's part I'm of like the Rain Man. <laughs> definitely, definitely without Windows. The math, definitely, without the math skills, you mean? Without the math skills. <laughs> um, there's probably a word for people like that who actually. Uh, they're just idiots. Have the bad part of it, but not right. the. <laughs> yeah. He was an idiot <laughs> you know, savant. Without the, just, without the savant. They're just yeah, the yeah. idiots. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. That's me. <laughs> John, I'm just the idiot. So, uh, image resizer for Windows. Didn't we talk? I thought we talked about this before. We may have. Um, I'm I'm sort of now uh, publishing the tip, uh, the uh, app picks to the site, which I didn't do in the past. So I think some of these might be redos. But um, Brett Berzicki, I'm sorry, I'm butchering that name. I'm sure recommended this, and this is just a replacement for an awesome power toy that we all used on Windows XP. Oh, yeah. It would allow you to right click and then resize from the context menu that appears. Um, these, a lot of these power toys, most of them now, don't work anymore in modern versions of Windows. So this is basically just a redo of that made by a third party that um, does work on Windows 7. So kind of a cool way if you want to uh, automatically resize an image. And it doesn't, not, it doesn't replace the original unless you tell it to. So maybe you want to email something and you want it to be a smaller size. You want to post a version of it online. So you want it to fit within a certain screen size or whatever. Um, this has all of the nice... Uh, presets and of course they're modern now they're not the presets from windows xp days a decade ago right where the email version would be you know 320 by 240 or some awful screen size um they have uh, better and more modern uh, presets so it's a cool tool it's a very very simple so if you need something like this uh definitely the way to go image resizer <laughs> yes. um and our windows phone 7 pick of the week yeah, this one's called Tasks at Last. Now, this is one of several tools that are available for this. Um, Windows Phone, as you may know, has good or excellent, depending on which part of this we're talking about, support for such things as uh, calendars, uh, contacts, and email from Exchange, and also Exchange type accounts, uh, Gmail and so forth, uh, um, email services or services that support Exchange ActiveSync. 
What it doesn't have is task support. So if you're an Outlook user or you, uh, you're an Exchange user, uh, these solutions have a tasks element as well, in addition to contacts, calendar, and email. Um, this provides that support to Windows Phone. Unfortunately, it's only for Exchange specifically. So if you have to have Exchange 2007 or Exchange 2010 for this work to work. But if it does, if you do, uh, this is an excellent uh, and, and Windows Phone style Windows Phone app, meaning it takes nice advantage of the Metro UI and it looks very much like a native app. So um, if you were looking for task support, I know a lot of people are, um, this is a, uh, definitely a good option. It, the only problem being, of course, that it doesn't work with, say, Gmail or, um, or Google Calendar. Um, what is Google Calendar called? Is I'm going to look. It's it, called have, Google Calendar. It's just called task. No, but they have a tasks. Oh, uh, oh, oh, I see what you're saying. Okay. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, Gcal it, probably right. I think it's just called. It's just, it, it, you can optionally turn on a tasks pane ah. in Google Calendar, which right. I do have on. Right. Uh, these things don't make their way down to the phone, and they won't work with this. I'd, Hopefully someday there'll be an Exchange Active Sync tasks solution that will work across all of the uh, EAS type accounts, including Google. But for right now, uh, this one here is uh, Exchange only. Mr. Therat, we have come to the end of another fabulous edition of Windows Weekly, only yes, interrupted by lunch once. <laughs> oh, did you get lunch? I don't know. I ordered it, but I don't see anything. It's coming. <laughs> That's like snapping of fingers back there. Scurrying of activity. <laughs> Mr. Laporte's lunch. Mr. Laporte's lunch. Uh, Paul is uh, the editor-in-chief of the Super Site for Windows, which is really a great site. In fact, it's, uh, it's kind of a must bookmark. And you do RSS. Do you do full RSS feeds or just, you know, the top part of it? I don't even know. You know Let me look. I bet it's not the full RSS. but Well, it's a good thing to put in your RSS I haven't looked reader. at that in a while. Uh, super site for Windows, winsupersite.com. He's also news editor for Windows IT Pro. He's an analyst at Penton Media. I mean, his resume is longer than my arm. He uh, is best known, perhaps, as the author of the Delphi 6 Super Bible, the Windows 6. It, wasn't, it was not Delphi 6, by the way. It was Delphi 3. Delphi 3 Super Bible. I should have known had I read it. I would have known. Leo, let me tell you about the DCL <laughs> briefly. No, please. No. Can we say that for next time? My lunch is I here. still remember <laughs> the object oh, and its dear. descendants. And uh, he is uh, also found uh, every week uh, right here at live.twit.tv, roughly 2 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Uh, Pacific time on uh, Thursdays. And uh, if you want to watch, please do tune in live.twit.tv. It's on the World Wide Web it's kind of a web of soul. That thing's still around, huh? Yes, it is. Way. Doesn't that sound a little uh, uh, antiquated? It, it always, you know, like, the World Wide Web always sounded weird to me. It's the World Wide Web. It's just such an old-fashioned, weird it is. name. Or something that's, you know, obviously modern. And, um, uh, but do tune in. Yeah. And, of course, if you miss it, you can get it at twit.tv slash dub dub for Windows Weekly. And, oh, I was going to play, and I will play right now yes. as a tribute to our good friend, um, Mr. Derek K. Miller, who passed away yesterday. Uh, this is his website, Pen Machine. And the song, which he created in 2006, I found it uh, then, mm -hmm. was called More Red Than Red. And then he did a shorter version, Less Red Than Red. He <laughs> says it was written for a, a short web film. Um, yeah. And then it says, sometime later, Leo Laporte started using it as his theme for the Windows Weekly Podcast with Paul Therod. And I think a, a nice way... To say um, so long to one of the one of nature's noblemen and a really uh, really great guy, uh, Derek K. Miller. Penmachine.com is his <laughs> website, and it's down, baby. <laughs> it is, it is, it is, it is, it is down. Yeah, but we'll. Uh, I'll tell you what. Oh, we'll, down. Yeah, well, so many people are reading uh, his last post. Yeah. I think. Um, yep. So I I will add this to the show, but uh, we won't do it live. And people can hear it on the show. Actually, I probably have it here somewhere. I'll find it. Paul, thanks so much. We'll see you next time on Windows Weekly.
Thanks, Derek. We're going to miss you.